to breed with this cock. I want to breed him to a dark hen like the hen on top, on top, and I want to breed myself good muffed grizzle pigeons. So there's a plan with that bird. After I bred some babies, then he can go fly and he can do his three and five and seven seconds and make a mistake. <laughs> Okay, 100% you've started, yeah, yeah start. yes. Tabang, uh, from your side, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, for visiting me today. I feel it's a real honor to uh, have you here and to actually uh, share, share my findings in pigeon breeding with you. And uh, I wish you all the best in your interiors. Thank you. And uh, my God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, the first question is How did you get into roller pigeons? And where or who did you get them from? It's many years back. Oh, many years back. I, um, like any pigeon breeder, I possibly started with. What you don't have today. Is it? I saw pigeons at pet shops, uh, started with fat tails and homers at the stage. But then one day I saw some pigeons flying and I saw them going backwards, falling out of the sky. Oh. And uh, I used to grow up with my grandfather and grandmother and my two uncles. Oh. And then when my grandfather came home, I asked him, I want pigeons like that, I saw them today. So then he says we can go look for the house. So he takes me down, it was about a block away, we walk, and we find the birds, they're sitting on a double story roof. So we walk into the guy's yard, and uh, my grandfather asks him, is this the birds that were flying this afternoon? Yes. So yes, he says, he flies them every afternoon. He says, no, my grandson would like some of these pigeons. What are they called? So he said, they are called rollers. Oh. These are rollers. As a matter of fact, I think he mentioned the word tumblers. Oh. Now, in today's terms, tumblers is a big swear word. Oh, 100%. Because nobody wants to hear the word tumbler anymore. It's now rollers. So, uh, long story short, I can still remember that uncle's surname was Makitik. Oh. Very strange surname, Makitik. And my grandfather ended up uh, speaking to him, negotiating. And I, under correction, I think the price those years was something like 15 cents a pair. Wow. 15 South African cents a pair. Oh. So we walked back home. And my grandfather says, now what you got now, at that stage I had the fantails, English fantails. He says, what you do now, if you want those rollers, then you sell the fantails. You can't keep both. Oh, got it. So I sold the fantails to the pet shop. I went to Uncle McKittrick and I started with three pairs. Oh, when was this again? This was approximately in 1972. Oh. 1972, I started with rollers. Before that, it was fan tails and homers and whatever I could get my hands on. Oh, got it. Okay, so um, for the newcomers in the hobby, what are the three things that you would advise them to focus on when studying a roller pigeon family? I think number one is the guy has to form a picture form a picture of what he envisages that he would like to achieve oh, go visit as many roller pigeon fanciers that you can that will allow you to oh, visit yes. 
see what those guys do. See how they do it. Got it. Go to them when they actually train the birds. Go watch them when they feed the birds. Get yourself familiar with the routine oh. of caring for pigeons. Got it. Long before you decide that you want good or bad or deep or short or frequent rollers or not such frequent rollers. So long before you try and get clever, rather be humble and go and visit as many guys as you can to try and see and pick up knowledge on how to care for the birds. That's the most important thing. You know, you can go to the best breeder and you can go and buy birds from him. You can have all the money in the world and you can pay thousands of rands for pigeons. But you, if you haven't picked up the basic knowledge of how to care for them, you're going to be waste and lose your money. Correct. Correct. Okay. Does the size of the loft where you keep your birds have an impact or an effect on the pigeon's performance in the air? Yeah. It depends on if you're talking size and quantity of birds. Oh. The size of the loft. I don't think really matters. Oh, got it. What matters is the quantity of pigeons you put inside the loft. You can have a kit box of 500 by 500, half a meter by half a meter by half a meter square. And then you can get one fancier, he puts in 20 birds, another one puts in 12, the other one puts in 10, and the other one puts in 5. Oh. Now the common sense tells you that the 5 birds will prob probably be more happier in that little loft than 20 birds because there's much less stress so my actual answer to the question is make sure there's enough space enough purchase there must always be more purchase than what you have pigeons in the loft okay. if the loft is very small it's fine if you train the birds very often and they come out and they get to stretch the wings and so on. But keeping pigeons cooped up in a very small environment is not healthy. Mm. Very not, also not good. Especially for breathing. Pigeons pick up breathing problems if the lots are overcrowded. Okay? And it generates a lot of stress. There's continuous fighting, etc. etc. Got it. Got it. Uh, okay. How would you say someone must choose a mentor? Like, what would you, what would you advise someone who's a newbie to choose a mentor? You know, uh, the I have stood in many circles talking to pigeon breeders, oh, God. and I, I personally has never, I've never had a mentor. Is it? No. If, if you, if you, as I said, go visit as many guys as possible, find out from the next guy who's the next guy and the next guy. Go visit the guys. Ooh. Be your own mentor. Oh, correct. Pick up as much knowledge as you can from all different guys. Make your own abbreviations. Decide what will fit you. Because sometimes mentors, and I'm not talking about, I'm not bad now with any guy that's ever mentored or mentored a guy. Um, I think it's great. I think it's great if you could spend the time with a novice breeder um, and you have the time and you put in the effort to help the person. But um, at the end of the day, you have mentors that do certain things certain ways. And what he does at his house, there is no 100% guarantee that it's going to work at yours. Or in oh, your yeah. house. Now, for instance, let's say uh, you come and you give me advice and you tell me this is rigid, this is the way it must be. And I do exactly that. And I don't achieve nothing. What's going to happen? Yes. You know, especially with roller breeders. Roller breeders is a different strain of person. They're a different breed themselves, different human being. Oh, yes. That person will most probably nine out of ten times bad mouth. You could go and you can bad mouth that mentor. And say, that guy told me I must do this, this is crap, it doesn't work. He helped me from top to into the ditch. You understand what I'm saying? Correct. So be your own mentor. The decisions you make in your lots must be your own. 
I'm not anybody else's. The way you breed the pigeons, when you take two pigeons, you decide to breed from them. It must be your feeling. It must be what you feel is right, not what somebody else says. Yes. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong to try what Joe says and what Pito Andre says. Nothing oh. wrong. That's true. But the best advice I can give you is do what you feel is right. Oh, correct. Okay, um, there are people that, that have started their family out of a hen or a cock. Which do you prefer, a cock or a hen, in starting a, a family of roller pigeons? To me, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I've got no preference. Okay, no this, preference to be this question comes from... There are people that believe that uh, a cock has stronger genes. So if you're starting a family, you need to start a family from a cock because those genes are strong. Yeah. Oh. Now, <clears throat> if you talk about genes and you talk about mating pigeons, yes. there's no guarantee. Oh. No guarantee that the cock will be the dominant one in the pairing. No guarantee. Is it? There's a lot. There's a lot of times where pigeons, where you breed pigeons, yes, where they might be the dominant. Who, who can prove you wrong? Who can say that that's the actual fact? Okay. <laughs> if you look at color breeding, for instance, you get dominant color factors, exactly the same in genes. Oh. Exactly the same. That's my opinion. Oh. I'm not arguing with the fact that guys say breeding from cocks is better or breeding from hens is better. To me, it doesn't make a difference. Oh. If I've got a brilliant hen yes. and I think I want to build something out of her, I will give her four or five of my best cocks. Oh. If I've got a brilliant cock and I think I want to produce from, I'll give him three or four of my best hens. Why not? What's the difference? I want to work towards that specific pigeon. Whether it's a cock or a hen, it doesn't make no difference. Got it. Got it. Do you believe some colors roll better than other colors? I think color might play a factor in certain people's families that they know. <laughs> you know, um, you can have a guy that breeds. Let's, for instance, take uh, guys like the guys that breed the cat white stains, they are all white headed birds. Oh, yes. Mainly, mainly. Mainly, yes, that's true. And you get reds and blues and blacks. Exactly. Now, let's say in his family, the black birds are performing better. They are, at the end of the day, just that inch better than the red and the blue birds. No, correct. I don't believe it's got nothing to do with the color. It's, again, the genes. The genes that produces the performance, that produces the type, not the color. I cannot see anywhere where the color has got any specific, specific uh, influence on the actual genes of a pigeon. To be honest, there's guys that say grizzles are roll downs. Why does he say that? Because he had some grizzles that are all down. Oh. You can't make that abbreviation. You have guys that might say the black, black, bullet, can whites are better than the other colors. Oh. But why does he say that? He never had good red ones and he might never had good blue ones. Yes. And it differs from person to person. It depends what sits in your mouth. Yes. You know, I specifically, my preference is grizzles. Doesn't matter the color. Oh, color. Correct. I'm I'm not color blind, so I don't focus on the specific color. Oh, got it, got it. Okay, do you stock everything you breed? And how do you stock your birds? No. I, I don't stock everything I breed, definitely not. Um as you see now here in my lofts, yes. uh, I will stock a bird and start breeding with it. If it has met all the fundamentals that I wanted to achieve. Oh, got it. So as I mentioned previously, um, the fact that the bird is a controller for me to just put it in the breeding loft makes no sense. Oh, got it. You asked me, must the bird have everything? Now everything is, because I'm breeding multi-purpose. Yes. First of all, I want to breed birds with muffs. 
you know, I want to breed birds that I can show in the show pen, yes. and I want to breed birds that I can fly in competitions. Oh, God. Now, I went and I selected birds specifically for showing. It was not my intention to start flying them in competitions. But now I've moved one step further. So I have already achieved quite fair results in the showing of pigeons. Yes. And now I'm moving towards flying good rollers as well and trying to achieve better points, better scores. So it's a challenge that I've got. Ooh. Is that what I'm saying? Quite. So, so no. So um, in a competition team, do you fly more cocks or more hands? How do you do it? I fly the birds that are all the best at that time and on that time of the competition. Oh, if, but don't if, you balance them out? Where... No, it doesn't matter to me. Oh. I have flown competition where all of the birds are cocks. I have flown competition where there might be two eggs, where we fly five birds. I fly the birds that are on form yes. eight days before the competition. Eight days before the competition, I start looking at the birds which is on form. I select them in that last eight days. And I normally don't fly the birds two days before the competition. Oh. So on the third day before the competition, the birds that have impressed me the much, those will be the ones that are in the air on the competition. Whether it's a cock or a doesn't matter to me. Got it. Who would you say are the people you like and think are doing a great job with raising birds locally or internationally? You know what? <clears throat> Those are one of the questions that I said to you that I will not put preference on because I might say some things that will make me very unpopular. Okay. But I would rather, the way I would answer this question is, yes. is that I don't think there is great and less great oh. and worse guys breeding pigeons. But what I would like to say is, I know for a fact there's much better pigeons in the country than what there's breeders. Oh, got it. So, at the end of the day, I respect, I respect any guy, any guy, whether he is or top of the club, middle of the club, he's flying right at the bottom of his club points. He earns respect if he cares for the birds and he's got the love of the birds and he's got the passion. Those are, those, those are the fundamentals of breeding pigeons. Not whether you're a champion or you're second in the league or whatever. It's the effort you put in. You know, you can have a guy who puts in all the effort. Oh. But he's lying eighth in the federation. What does it make him? It doesn't make him worse than the first guy. Not in my eyes. No, that's true. No, no, the no. first guy has got better pigeons. He's not necessarily a better breeder. He's just got better pigeons. There's always somebody that has better. Oh, yes. You know, um, I like being cocky at shows. Yeah. In our competitions, I like being cocky. I'll tell the guys on the Wednesday, I hope your birds are right. I hope you're getting them right because your time is up. I'm coming for you on Saturday. And then Saturday I get a third place. Is it? Who cares? You know, it's all in the joy of flying birds and competing with birds. You can't just want to win the whole time. You know, you win some, you lose some. So I respect every guy. Every guy that puts in the effort. If I walk into a guy's yard to go and visit him, and I can see the passion for the birds. I can see clean lots. I can take his drinking bowl and I can drink out of the I can drink that water. Oh. If my if my piece of bolt of that he offers me falls on the floor in his loft and I can quickly pick it up the five second rule and I can eat it. Yes. Then, then he's earned respect. And you understand what I'm saying? Whew. Okay, um what has been your biggest challenge in raising rollers over the years? Man, first challenge, not just raising rollers, no. is keeping your pigeons healthy and happy. That's the first challenge. No. The second challenge, and the only last challenge, yes. is probably the most important challenge in any pigeon breeders. Yes. And that is to breed the ultimate champion. To breed the ultimate 
champion is what we, every one of us are trying to achieve every year. That's, right. That's why we keep on breeding. That's true. If we've achieved that already, yes. then why are we breeding every year? Yes. And then you can breed pigeons every fifth year. You know. So breeding the ultimate, ultimate champion, and you're just never happy. For some reason, you breed many champions, but pigeon breeders are very hard to please. Like me, myself, I'm just never happy. I want to breed a mottled, black mottled pigeon. And as soon as I have a black mottled pigeon, which is an absolute looker, and he rolls nice and everything, then the whole mindset changes again. Now I want to go past that. I want to now breed a fantastic blue one. Okay. And so it carries on. You know, so it just never ends. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, if you lost all your birds and had to start all over again, whose birds would you start off with? At the moment, I, I don't think I'll have a personal preference oh. of, of which guy I'll go and visit, you know. Um, I will probably choose a person that has birds very same or very similar to what I've got at the moment, you know. And um, on the distance rollers, if I might mention, is also because I'm, I'm prefer muffed birds. Um, I would probably go to guys like uh, Carl Loves, oh. um, uh, even guys, I'll find up a guy like BJ Singh, I've seen he's got nice birds with nice muffs. But to me it doesn't really matter whether he's a champion flyer or not. The, the, challenge is, the challenge is for me to achieve out of the birds that I fetch to achieve again what I've had. So there's no real specific preference, but yes, the, anybody that has pigeons that are similar to mine, I, I, I wouldn't just start totally with a different look, or a different color, or different breed. And as you see, this is this is a grizzle factory. Oh, this is so a grizzle factory. I, 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 I want grizzle pigeons. <laughs> oh, got it. Uh, okay, here's another one. Why is it that sometimes a bird can be your best roller in the air, but it never produces itself when it's breeding time? Again, it's genes. We've discussed genes. And you get birds, and you get it in racing pigeons as well. Oh. In, 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 even in human beings. Yes. You can be a top athlete. You can run the 100 meters under 10 seconds. There's no guarantees that your kids are going to achieve it. Oh, yes, that's true. Right. You know, it's exactly the same with pigeons. There's no guarantees. So, at the end of the day, the only way of doing it is, is test, try and test it. You need to test it. So, so you take the top bird, take the top bird and breed with it. And if it breeds top birds, it's carrying over that bird's specific genes. But there might be something else previously that comes through that is not as good as what that specific individual bird is so oh. now it becomes basically a non-producer oh and, and i've had that i've had that many times in my life many times with racing pigeons that i flew i flew racing pigeons for eight years i've been flying rollers for 51 years so i've had that many times that putting the best to the best there's no guarantee of always breeding better. You might breed similar. You might breed similar or maybe weaker. And even, in some senses, you might improve. Improving on your best is probably the most difficult to do. Oh, got it. Okay, taking, taking, something, taking something in the middle and working with it upwards is much easier to taking something that's at the top and taking that higher, if you understand what I'm saying. Got it. it becomes more difficult. The better your birds get, the more active, let's say you, you work on activity or you work on length. Yes. The more active the birds get, the deeper they get. So what do you want to improve? How deep do you really want them? You understand? Eventually you might start breeding pigeons that kill themselves after three weeks in the air because you're trying to overachieve. If your bird, you can take roll downs, and they might breed you birds that take two years to roll, which gives you no pleasure, 
And the second time the bird comes in the roll, it also rolls down. So what have you done? What have you achieved? Nothing. You basically achieved nothing. So there's no guarantees. The thing is, you have to breed with birds, trial and error, see what they do, measure the genes, and work from them. Okay. Okay, um, I don't know if you, you'll be able to answer this one, but let's let's have it let's have at it. Okay, most people have South African distance rollers with muffs. What's your take on South African distance rollers without muffs? There's no to me there's no real difference. There's no real difference. There's no real difference. It's preference. Basically preference. They are both rollers. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I've heard people say that uh, with SA distance, they need to have muffs. Because the muff, it helps in kicking open when it's rolling a, a certain distance. They need those muffs. They need very big muffs. So, so, so what they're saying is the muffs help them as brakes. It gives them more brakes. In a way, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in a way, I don't know. I honestly, if you want my honest opinion, I don't think it's it's relevant. Is it? No. If a bird is a roll down, he can have ten centimeter muffs. If, he, if he's gonna come, if he's gonna hit the ground, he's gonna hit the ground. That is true. And I've seen it. That is true. Um, th th there's no guarantees. A bird, bird with clean legs, yes. you must remember, he doesn't come out of the roll with his legs. He comes out of the roll with his wings. If he stops, if he stops the muscle movement of the wings that rotates him backwards, yes. then he's going to stop rolling. You know, kicking out his feet while his wings are still operating and the muscle movement for the rollers there, feet is not going to help. It will make him possibly look worse, you know, in the roll, but not help him. If he's a roll down, he's a roll down. Oh, you know. That is true. That is true. That is true. Uh, okay, um, two of your favorite colors. I know we're in the grizzle factory, but two of your favorite colors. <laughs> That's a difficult one. Eh? It's I'm a di actually, I can show you. Okay. Black mottle. Black mottle, as you, you, you guys will see on my... Black mottle is probably my most favorite. Is it? <laughs> Probably my most favorite. Oh, I see Black one here. Models. I see one here. Oh, got it. Got it. Oh. And then, and then I like what they call classic grizzle. Now, classic grizzle is actually a blue grizzle feature. You won't see many of them here. Let me see if there's something. There is one sitting at the bottom there with a bar. Now, classic grizzle is basically a blue pigeon, blue grizzle, showing the bars. Oh, good. Okay. So those are my two favorites in the grizzles. And of course, then my preference is any other red grizzle. Some guys call them splashes. Oh, uh, it just needs to be a grizzle. Just a grizzle. Color preference, but my eye, my eyes get. Get totally watery if I see a very nice black bottle. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, okay. When you make your birds, do you breed long to short or short to short? How do you do it? To be honest, um, the one I, I try I try and breed birds as far as I can the birds that roll the same distance oh. very close to the same distance so if I have two three second birds yes I will make the two three second birds um, I have found in the past yes that two three second birds can easily breed you a two second bird that can breed you a five second bird that can even breed you a roll down. Oh. It depends on when you mix the genes. God. Now, to be honest, what I have tried now this year, yes. I have tried two or three pairs where the cocks are very deep and the hens are much shorter. But the birds carry most, 
Mostly the same look for family gene. So I'll see what comes out of that. But to me, I don't think you, the rule of thumb is breed a long bird to a short bird and you'll breed a happy medium. Oh. I, I don't see the guarantee on that. It's not impossible, but I don't see the guarantee. I have never guaranteed myself with any breeding in my life by breeding a long bird with a short bird and say so I'm going to get an in-between a happy medium. Yes, you might. You might. But I breed out of those type of pairs. I breed birds that don't even grow at all. I breed birds that are all down within the first three weeks. You understand? <laughs> uh, once you have, let's call it a click pair, the guys talk, start talking about a click pair. Oh, yes. They make these two birds and every youngster that these birds breed rolls for them two to three seconds or five to eight on the main distance. So basically every youngster that breeds rolls an average of this length. Then you call it a click pair. But while you, while you are building on top of your breed and your family of pigeons and you experimenting, there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees. So the guys that have click pairs, you'll see them, they will breed those pairs every year for three, four, five years. And they will take the best of those youngsters and they will move them into the stock because those are the birds with stability. You need stability in the rovers. You don't need this up and down graphic. You want to get rid of that as soon as possible because otherwise every year you get guys that breed 150 birds because he's got a graphic that does this. He's got no stability in his loft. Hmm. So he loses a lot of birds by roll down, making mistakes when they fly out of the loft, making mistakes when they come and sit. Um, some are getting lost when they're young. You get pigeons that just get lost. If you don't spend a lot of time breaking them in, they fly away. They don't have common sense or savvy to start off with. So that is not a solid graphic of breeding pigeons. So once you have that in your love, you need to do stricter selection. To ask yourself, what do I want? Do I want to carry on like this? Then do whatever you're doing and every year the same thing and expect different results. <laughs> or do different selecting of birds. Say, listen, I'm going to now take my three second row. Yes. I don't want this one, three, five, eight, twelve, fifteen. Seven. I want to take my three second row. And I want to just breed with them. This year, put them together. I want to take my five and six second rows, put them together. I want to take my eight second rows, put them together. See what I get. See what I get out of them. And then at the end of the day, whatever makes you happy. And the achievement that's the best for you, that's what you work with. What do you think about roll downs? Do you think they can be used in building a family or just breeding them? You know, there are other people that see things differently. They might think roll downs can work in building a family. What's your take on roll downs? You know, talking about the roll down is a difficult subject. Because you must define the roll down. Oh. At the end of the day, a pigeon that makes a mistake. Yes. The, let's say the pigeon is a five second roller. Yes. It's far enough from the ground. Oh. The pigeon is a constant five second roller. And that pigeon comes down to come and sit. And for some reason he goes into a full roll and is only three seconds from the ground. And he makes a mistake. Let's say he makes a mistake. He doesn't kill himself, he only hurts himself. You put him up in the air again. He does the five second thing up in the air, okay? As soon as he comes closer to the ground, he does it again. Three seconds from the ground, he comes, he hits the ground again. Is that a roll down? No. Or is it a mistake? It's a mistake. A mistake is if a bird only does it once or twice. Yes, it if he keeps on doing it, if he keeps on doing it, I won't breed with him. Because he keeps on making the same mistake. The same error every time is not, you can't oversee it anymore. Once, twice. If the bird then learns, and once he's 
out of his boundary where he must roll. And he then controls himself. I'm not saying he mustn't roll at all. But let's say he controls himself and he gives a shorter roll. He gives a two-second roll. And he keeps himself safe in the air. Because that's what you're trying to achieve. That's what you're trying to achieve. Imagine I fly a competition and I've got eight-second rollers. And those eight-second roller birds go up in the air. Beautifully, I fly the 15 minutes. I win the competition. Those birds come down when they are in three or four seconds off the ground clearance. All of them roll, they all hurt themselves. Where am I sitting next month? Hmm. I'm sitting with a big problem. Okay. So what you're trying to achieve is to get a bird that does not make mistakes. Oh, got it. And can learn. So you don't even want the eight second bird to tend to roll when he's not further than eight seconds from the ground. Oh. As easy as that, that's the rule. So, talking about roll downs is a very long subject. You know, a bird can come, a speck in the sky, and come all the way, all the way, all the way, all, all the way, and he disappears on the horizon, and you don't even see him fall. He comes back two days later with a hurt leg. So what's that now? That's a long roller. He came back with his leg. I didn't see him fall. He might have hit the tree or something. You put the same bird back in the air. The next day, or a week later when he's recovered, that bird gives you three to five seconds. So what happened? Oh. A week ago. So can I call that bird a roll down? Nope. If I recover the bird, if I recover the bird, heal him, he's healed, put him back in the air, he does a couple of short ones and suddenly off he goes again into the ground. Is he worth something for me? He's not a constant pigeon. That pigeon, that pigeon also I'll call a roll down because he makes the same mistake. Oh yes, that's true. So in my eyes, just to finish it off with, because I can talk possibly a week about this. Oh yes. A roll down yes. is a roller that makes continuous mistakes. Oh. Whether he rolls two seconds, Five seconds, 20 seconds. It's a roller that hits something when he rolls. Continuous mistake making is a roll down. And those birds, I will not read. Oh. You will not see the stock. Got it. Out of all the birds that you have in your family of birds, what made you choose uh, those birds that you're flying in competition? You mean my five pigeons that I'm flying in? On the Saturday of the competition. Exactly. Yeah. What would you choose? What are the requirements for them to meet in order for you to choose that I'm going to fly these for competition? Okay. If you look at the flying rules, yes. The flying rules of the distance runners is you get points for grouping. Yes. You get points for flying and you get points for rolling. Oh, got it. Now, to me. The birds that I'll choose yes. is the bird that will most probably on that day, 99.9%, I need to be sure that the birds that I'm going to fly is not going to cost me points on any one of those factors that I need to compete in the competition. Got it. Okay. So I watch my birds carefully. If I have a bird that rolls and doesn't make it to the kick within the required five minutes of time, then that bird is not, I'm not going to take the chance. Mm. If I have a bird that, for instance, does not even roll within the 15 minutes or only rolls after about 13 or 14 minutes in the air, so I'm going to take a chance with that bird because the competition is only 15 minutes long. So now, if a bird only rolls, if it's his the way the bird works for you, if he only rolls after 13 or 14 minutes in the air, yes, you're taking the risk of putting him in a 15-minute competition. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I'm looking at birds from my side. I look at my birds that will roll within at least the first eight minutes of in the air. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Now, fortunately, what I'm reading at the moment you saw today, I put them up, it's approximately three minutes odd, they are at a decent height and they already started to roll. So there's no long waiting period to see some action. 
Oh, okay. got it. And got I've it. judged a lot of guys as birds. Oh, yes. And a lot of them get no roles. And then the competition is over and three, four minutes later, there comes that bird that can roll. But it took so long and that bird has cost him points. So yes, I choose the birds that I'm 99% sure will not cost me points. Okay, how many birds do you stalk in a year? What's your standard for stalking? I might not even stalk any bird in a year. Might, might every three years. You understand? I mean, if you stalk a bird every year, let's say young birds, I unfortunately, my position now, I've got some going for two year old birds and some going now for one year old babies. <laughs> so stocking birds every year for me is not a necessity. While they're sitting here yes. and I'm flying and enjoying them, they are stock birds because I'm keeping them. Oh. I can breed with any bird here anytime. Oh, anytime. Correct. If correct. I if I can achieve which I do with a lot of the birds. A lot of my stock birds are going back to the air. Oh, got it. Because they are not, they're not dangerous rollers. And as soon as I can, I've got plenty of them. I've got five brothers, I've got four sisters, and I, got, and, and I can reproduce. Then there's no real risk. If you've got one left yes. of that specific breed, then treasure it and breed a couple first. But otherwise you can put them back in the air. Oh. But every bird that you see uh, is a potential stock bird. Oh, okay. You know why I'm asking this, Om? Um, uh, it's because I've had people that say they could breed probably 100 birds in a year. Yeah. After breeding uh, 100 birds, from that 100, they will probably stock maybe 7 or 10 birds. Yeah. Why? Because uh, not everything that you breed will produce you what you want or yeah. does not meet the requirements that you want. So no wonder some will give a number, probably they would say, if, if I bred 100, I'll, I'll stock probably 7 or 8 yes. and then get rid of some of them. Maybe I can give them to someone else or send them to the pet shop and work on the ones that I've already stocked because they've met the requirements from, from for flying, kitting, rolling, going back to the kid and all of that. I'm asking that because of that. Yes. It's, it's all perfect. It's fine if you do it like that. Because if the guy breeds 100 pigeons and he's got seven that he really treasures. Oh, God. If that's his preference, he can put them away. He can put them in the stock. Because he, then, he, then he lessens the chance of losing it or catching it, the pigeon hurting itself. If you really want to treasure it, take it and put it away. Um, I don't have a lot of physical sentiment sentiment on, on pigeon breeding. Oh. Um, if, if I lose a bird, I try and breed another one, you know. Oh, uh, if it's the only one left, then I'll possibly put it away quicker. I mean, there's a bird sitting here. I looked at it the other day. If I see that cock, you can show them that. If I see that mottled cock of mine, he's lying right here. If I see this cock rolling one second, this cock, as soon as, as, soon as he goes into a roll one second, that will be the last day he's flying. Oh. And I'm putting him away because <laughs> I've got plans with him that I don't have with any other cock here. Oh, got so it. I want to breed with this cock. I want to breed him to a dark hen like the hen on top. on top, And I want to breed myself good muffed grizzle pigeons. So there's a plan with that bird. After I bred some babies, then he can go fly and he can do his three and five and seven seconds and make a mistake. You see? Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, who are the people would you say your birth started out from? Where did you get your birth from? Yeah. <clears throat> the birds I got was from Christy Trotsky, a friend of mine. We flew Birmingham rollers together as well. And then oh. he started with the distance rollers. He got birds from everybody, a lot of fanciers. Oh. Um, and then when I wanted to start, I called him and said, I want to uh, 
can I come and visit or want to have a look at the, the, the distance rollers because I I feel I want to breach some and show them with my show, show pigeons. At that stage, I was still flying Birmingham rollers competitively. So uh, he said, no problem. So I went to his house and I looked at birds that he has free, that he doesn't that add value to, he doesn't really want them. Oh. I can choose from that, oh. which was nice. So I choose three pairs that I actually liked. Oh. Choose the three pairs. Um, he gave them to me, I brought them home and I matched them. And uh, before I mated them, before I mated them, my Birmingham's were flying and I see this pigeon with a blue wing coming across them in the air. He comes down with them, he's got small little muffs, and he goes into my furthest loft. Pigeon goes in there. So I catch the pigeon and I look at him and I like it a lot. Yes. And that's the old cock sitting there, the 2017 cock. Oh. So I trapped the bird. Oh. <laughs> so it's a bird that just came here. So I took the ring, I put it on the group, and whose bird was it? It was Kirstu's bird. Oh. And I said to Kirstu, he says, well, Tommy, it's my pigeon. I'll come and fetch it later. I said, not anymore. <laughs> Kirstu, it's not your pigeon anymore. I'll come fetch a hen. Or I'll bring you one of the cocks back you gave me. I'm going to keep the pigeon. So he said, it's fine. So he says, but it doesn't roll well. It only rolls three seconds. I said, that's fine. I want the pigeon. So I keep it. So I don't really know. The only pigeon that I could possibly get pedigree from is that specific pigeon that he bred. The others he didn't breed. He got them from different breeders. I tried to trace. Uh, no, not one of the guys are really sure how he bred, what he did. So it doesn't come from top, top fanciers, oh. which, as I said, doesn't bother me. I wanted them specifically because I wanted to breed something to show. But now I've gone one step further. I'm going to try and achieve some good results in the air as well. Right. According to you, what is temperament and strong character in a bird? Uh, you know, birds are like human beings. Oh, every, yeah, yeah. Every bird has got it, belongs on its own. Every bird has got its own reaction, its own temperament, the way it moves, the way it flies, the way it, 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 it operates in the loft. So you get birds that are dominant, dominant, they continuous fighters, they want every perch, um, stuff like that. Um, what I really like is the bird that every time I look at it, yes. the bird is naturally vibrant. Oh, God. And you can see that the bird is interested. It's not a bird that sits there it's shy, that's crouched. I don't like pigeons that's always crouched. Um, I like a bird that shows you some power. Oh, Just be a proud bird. And you get that in pigeons. You get that. If the pigeon, and you normally see it a lot when they're outside. When they're outside or roaming, or when they come into the loft, you can see the proud birds. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, not, not necessarily the dominant bird, you know, but a pigeon that every time you look at it, it's a pleasure looking at the bird. Quite it. You know, that's the bird I prefer. Okay, when should young birds start coming into their role? I've seen birds that started coming into their role at three months or eight months. I think it's a preference to me. For me personally, I like to see a bird already showing that it is gonna gonna roll whatever the distance will be. Oh, yes. they at least show me within a time period of about three months. Oh. If a bird in three months makes a roll of half a second to a second or one and a half seconds, and I can see the speed and the way it develops when it opens up the direction of flight. I can already start seeing in the development if there might be any mistakes later. Ooh. You know, if a young bird that starts rolling and every time he opens up it's a different direction or on the short roll he already twitches or switches in the roll, I don't like those type of things. I like a bird when it rolls it and rolls straight. When it opens up it must be in the direction of flying. 
If he was busy flying north, if he rolls and he opens up, it must be north when he opens up. Not then south, because he's turning away from the kid. Okay. Um, that, that merely comes from flying Birmingham's for many years. Oh. Because you want that bird as quick as possible back in the kit. You okay. can't afford birds turning away from the kit and spending one and a half minutes to get back to the kit. Not with Birmingham's. The bird rolls two seconds, you want him back into the kit within three, four seconds. Ten seconds later, he needs to roll again. You need a frequency of three to four rolls per minute. Now on the distance rollers, it's a different thing. Oh, the pigeon, yeah. a pigeon that does 10 seconds, 14 seconds, can't be expected to be back in the kit within seconds. Oh, yes. You understand? That's right. So, it's the preference. You, you, you need to look at what you prefer. Um, my, my late friend, Corey Wistason, which I dearly miss, um, he flew Ken White's. Oh, yes. Um, he also won the Ken White show in 1987 here in South Africa. Which Ken White? Are, are you talking Ken about White the... from England. From England. From oh, England. I thought you meant the Ken White's, the long birds of Pretoria. No, it's the same guy. It's the same guy. Same guy. Same oh, guy. it's Birmingham. Got it, got it. The Ken got White's it. in Pretoria comes from Birmingham. It's Birmingham rollers from Ken White. Oh, yes. Now, Ken White visited South Africa in 1987 and he was a judge at one of the biggest roller shows ever held in South Africa. And my late friend, Corey, was the passed away January this year. Oh, he won that show. He was still a youngster then. Oh, yeah. Corey was still a youngster, five, six years out of school. Hmm. He won that show. And he built a family oh, wow. out of that hen that won that show for this. Over 500 birds on that show hmm. won the show. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, so it's heartbreaking. Let's get the next question.